You're listening to The Real Investment Show. You know, I wish I had a talent for script writing because this whole Sam Bankman freed FTX saga has a movie written all over it um, at some point. Young tech California whiz kid delves into the cryptic world of cryptocurrency, builds this firm, becomes a billionaire behind the scenes, you know, using, you know, commingling client funds, falling in love with, uh, you know, your head trader of, of your kind of sister firm. You're shoveling money back and forth between the two, having this affair with her. Uh, the whole thing comes apart. Everything, everything goes wrong. And your girlfriend slash lover turns rat with the FBI and turns you in, right? And um, yesterday, Sam Bankman Fried was arrested in the Bahamas, charged with wire fraud, wire fraud conspiracy, securities fraud, and conspiracy to commit securities fraud. Um, this is going to be a very interesting thing to watch and, and the end result of this. Again, you know, the, the guy that is now the CEO of FTX is the former head of Enron who took them through the bankruptcy process as well um, when Enron went bankrupt back in early 2000. So again, the, the Securities and Exchange Commission, I'm reading this off the headlines, um, have, have filed this indictment. And they are also saying that this was basically a house of cards. And so this is not going to turn out well. You know, the, one of the problems that, you know, Sam Bankman Fried's going to have is that he's been on this whirlwind media tours of late, you know, trying to pull off this simple jack defense, which is I was just basically too stupid to know what was going on and I had no idea and it wasn't me and it was, it was every, everybody else, but you're the you're the head of the firm, right? I mean, you're the guy that is is putting it out there. Of course, you know, the, the lawyers that were wanting to potentially represent him have had to be going, just shut up, please stop talking. Just stop talking <laughs> at this point. He was supposed to testify to today? Yes. Uh, yeah, today on Capitol Hill. Um, that has now been denied. He will not be doing that basically because he's been arrested and waiting extradition. But finally, the lawyers got to him and said, stop talking. And so, you know, this is, this, this is going to be kind of interesting because, again, he's laid out his whole case in the, in the public, um, trying to play the simple jack defense. I, I screwed up. I didn't know what I was doing. It was just bigger than me. And, you know, there's just, that's just not going to hold up well. But pretty much you've admitted to the whole scheme already in public media. And, all, and you know, whoever was putting the case together on you – was sitting there going, well, I'll just use that. I'll just use that one. I'll just use that one. And just basically laid out the case. So anyway, um, the the sentence on this is, is interesting. Um, there was a, a gentleman a lawyer that had made the assessment that he could get up to 612,000 years in prison. And this is how he got to the number. That ain't going to happen, by the way. <laughs> you know, I predict probably if if he goes to prison, right, 15 to 20 years, minimum security, fed, you know, federal prison. Um, but there are some mitigating factors here. Um, federal sentencing guidelines, I'm going to read this because it's too complicated for me to, to quote it off the top of my head. Federal sentencing guidelines follow a numeric system to determine the maximum and minimal, minimum allowable sentence. And that's the, that's the key word here, the minimum allowable sentence. But the system can be esoteric. So the scale or offense level starts at 1 and maxes out at 43. So obviously, the higher the number, the worse it is off for you. A wire fraud conviction rates as a 7 on the scale. So if he's convicted of wire fraud, he's immediately at 7. With a minimum sentence ranging from 0 to 6 months. So no big deal. But mitigating factors and enhancements can alter that scale. The dollar value of the loss plays into plays a significant role. Under the guidelines, any loss above $550 million adds 30 points to the base level. So he's got four charges. Just assume one. Wire securities fraud, he's at seven. Losses of $550 million adds 30. Okay, 
these people lost billions of dollars. So he's already at 37 out of a possible 43. Having 25 or more victims adds another six points of certain regulated markets, and that adds four. So there's another 10. So that means that, that you know, under that scale, right? I mean, he's already maxed out. So, you know, he's facing potentially life in prison over this. But I, I, look, again, big Democratic donor. Rain, the, the, the amount of donations ranges from $30 million to a billion. Nobody knows for sure exactly how much money got shoveled, you know, into political figures. But that's, the point about that is, is it wouldn't matter if that was Republican money, right? You made a lot of friends politically. That's going to help pull, you know, some phone calls are going to get made. This is, hey, young, you know, take it easy on him. So, again, you know, I doubt he, I very seriously doubt he gets life in prison, but it could be a pretty stiff sentence. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, the, the, the ultimate consequence of this is whether he goes to prison or not, right? Um, you're never going to be involved in the securities markets again. You know, that, that's, that's going to be part of the, you know, end of this. So, you know, it's a shame at the end of the day. I'm sure he had the best of intentions. And, I, you know, I'm not, so, I'm not so sure. You know, there's a lot of people that say he's, he's kind of like an Elon Musk, right? He's super sharp. He knows everything that's going on. Maybe he is a simple jack. Maybe, he, you know, maybe this was just a lot bigger than him. And he really knew his stuff about, you know, creating an exchange. And maybe he really knew his stuff about cryptocurrency. But running a business, being the CEO of a company that is worth billions of dollars of other people's money, Right. At the ripe old age of 26, 27, 28. I mean, you just don't have the life experience for it. Right. Don't have the business experience for it. And so maybe it did just all get away from him. Maybe he was coerced and duped by the people that were around him. And because there's apparently out of all this money that's magically disappeared, there was a billion dollars worth of money granted to employees in terms of loans. Right. Oh, you want to go buy a house? Well, here's a loan for $100 million to go buy a house, you know, whatever. So, you know, you just don't do that. But again, you know, he probably didn't know better. I'm, I'm trying to give him the benefit of the doubt, guys. Come on. <laughs> yeah. I'm hoping. I mean, he seems like a nice guy, but, you know, this, this is just not going to go well. But, you know, the, the, the end story of this, unfortunately, is twofold. One is that this will be a very sad ending to his potential life. I mean, this guy he was, you know, he'll he'll be in prison going, yeah, I was a billionaire once. You know, that sucks. That just uh, that's terrible. You you kind of got life by the tail. You're famous. You've got all the money in the world. You more than you could ever ever possibly spend in your lifetime, and you know, you reach too far, right? You reach for the sun, you eventually get burned, and. The other side of this, of course, is this just throws the whole crypto, this kind of emerging cryptocurrency market environment into question, right? This was supposed to be the great innovation. This was supposed to be the thing that changes the way that we operate. It was going to be, you know, there's, a, you know, the, the group of, of kryptonite people over here. They were like, oh, this is going to get rid of the currency. We, you know, we won't need the U.S. dollar anymore. It just, and, and it's going to be a free market system. And, and it's all great ideas, right? But, you know, these type of things just throw all that into question. Um, U.S. stablecoin is now limiting withdrawals of their stablecoin. Now, this is the, the dollar-linked coin, crypto coin, that basically replicates the U.S. dollar, so to speak. In other words, it has a stable value of one. But they're having to limit withdrawals because people are concerned. It's like, are you the next? FTX. We don't know. See, I mean, you know, now the whole thing's into question. You know, Binance is still alive. They're now the hundred, you know, the eight hundred pound gorilla in the exchange market. But are they next? Right. So we just don't know. And that's what I'm saying. You know, what happens is when you have this type of development, it just throws the whole system into question, and nobody knows. It's like, is my money safe? Look, there are people that had all their life savings in FTX. Now they have nothing. You know, this, this is real damage to real people and real markets. And, and yeah, I mean, this, you know, you know Sam Bankman-Fried, 
you know, simple jack defense or not, whatever happens to him happens. But there are real people that lost real money, and it's all the money they had. This isn't a bunch of just, you know, rich, you know, rich, you know, private equity people that, you know, lost a few billion bucks by investing in the startup company. This was real money that belonged to real people. Those assets are gone and recovery is going to be hard. There's a, like $100 million in real estate in the Bahamas that was accumulated. I, I'm interested to see if ultimately uh, Sam Bankman Freed's parents don't get drug into this because they were buying properties in the Bahamas for FTX. But the Bahamian authorities are now wanting those properties back to try to raise some assets to give back to some of the customers. And this is the same thing that the new CEO of FTX is trying to do as well, is now going through. And he's he's even said the same thing. He says, this is just a, a mitigated mess, worse than Enron. That's, that's a leap, by the way, to be worse than Enron. But he's just trying to recover assets, trying to get, you know, the, the depositors some of their money back. We'll see how it goes. All right, quick break. Be right back. Other side of the break, don't go away. daily investment news you can use delivered at the speed of the internet at realinvestmentadvice.com and welcome back to the show this morning uh so just to wrap up our FTX conversation, uh, there's some more headlines hitting just even just over the break here. Um, this coming from the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission said it will file charges against FTX founder Sam Bankman Freed on Tuesday relating to violations of securities laws, accusing him of orchestrating a scheme to defraud equity investors in FTX and seeking to ban him from the crypto industry. Again, like I said, that's not surprising. Um, we allege, this is from SEC Chair Gary Gensler, uh, who has also just been found out to be, you know, deleting meetings with high-ranking political figures off of his calendar. Um, we allege that Sam Bankman Freed built a house of cards on a foundation of deception while telling investors that it was one of the safest buildings in crypto. The SEC made the announcement Monday morning after the Bahamian authorities arrested Sam Bankman Freed, the U.S. Attorney's Office, Southern District of New York confirmed. Now, so there's a couple of things going on here. You got the SEC, there's civil and criminal charges being filed. So, you know, civil charges just get you a fine and banned from the industry, criminal ch charges get you jail time. Uh, Gruber Grewal. Uh, we commend our law enforcement partners for securing the arrest of Sam Bankman Freed on federal criminal charges. The SEC, so this is what I'm talking about. The SEC, civil, has authorized separate charges relating to his violations of the securities laws to be filed publicly tomorrow in the Southern District of New York. So again, you've got federal criminal charges. That's your jail time. Your civil charges come out of the SEC. That is going to be fines, penalties, and banning from the industry. So possible outcomes range all over the board. Could get no jail time, but never be able to work in the industry again, right? You know, you hear about these guys that commit com computer hacking, right? They can never touch a computer again for the rest of their lives, type, that type of thing. Um, you know, you'll never be allowed back in the industry. Uh, not sure that anybody would trust him anyway, but, but there you go. Um, the SEC has charged Bankman Freed with violating anti-fraud provisions of the Securities Act of 1933 and the Securities and Exchange Act of 1934. Uh, by the way, if you don't know the story about this, just kind of an interesting byline of history. And, and unfortunately, we don't 
really kind of pay much attention to history anymore. But, you know, there was a point in time where the securities markets were not very well regulated. Um, 1920 to 1929, banks were taking money, loaning it to their customers to buy the IPOs that the banks were issuing. Right. So it was one big closed loop. I loan Brent money. And then I turn around and say, oh, I'm going to loan you $100,000 to buy this IPO I'm coming up with. And Brent goes, that sounds great, right? Because everything's just going up. 1929, stocks hit a permanently high plateau. It's all over. Stocks crash between 1929 and 1933. Lose 85% of their value. And then, as is always the case, after you have an event, whatever it is. And, of course, don't forget, at the peak of that 1929 bubble, was Charles Ponzi with the original Florida real estate Ponzi scheme. Hold that thought for a moment because we're going to come back to it. So after the crash, and we realize that banks should be playing with the, you know, playing both sides of the markets, we say, okay, we're going to separate things out. So we established the Securities and Exchange Acts of 1933 and 1934. 33 established the SEC, 1934 Act put it into action with all the regulations. Then we passed the um, Investment Act of 1940 for mutual funds. Um, and things ran pretty well, honestly, um, through 2000. And then we kind of started started dinkering with laws, starting easing up financial restrictions and allowing banks and brokers to play together again and removing the Chinese walls and all that. And then, of course, once you start doing all those type of things and making it easier for, for banks to become Wall Street, and now it's one big closed circular loop again, like it was in 1920 to 1929, you have bad things happen in the markets. Of course, 2008, you have the big crash at the peak of the market going into 2008. What do you have? Bernie Madoff with the Ponzi scheme. So everything's fine. Then following the financial crisis, we start fueling the markets with all kinds of money. We relax regulations. We ignore things. We allow all kinds of other stuff to happen. Uh, you know, uh, share buybacks go crazy. Stocks are, 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 are running out of, of, of madness. And then in 2020, we just flood the markets with liquidity. And we start coming out with SPACs and IPOs. And everybody's just coming to market. And, and there's so much money chasing so few assets that nobody's paying attention to the risk. We're just buying everything. And you have a big bubble. And at the peak of the bubble, you have another fraud. Happens every time, right? And so we're going to get more regulated. So the point about this is, is that the SEC is charging him under violations of the Act 33, 34. But we're going to get more regulation coming out of this eventually because it's what happens. You know, after the dot-com crash, we had what? Sarbanes-Oxley. Got to fix the, the Enron problem. 2008, 2000, 2007, 2008, financial crisis. We're going to have Dodd-Frank, right? We defanged that one pretty quick because that was impairing the banks from ripping off, I mean, uh, helping customers. <laughs> so we'll have regulation after this as well. But that's what happens. We always have to come in and put the fire out after the fire is already out, right? We never, we never, we never think about these things in advance. We always relax these regulations. Oh, that'll never happen again. And then, of course, it happens. Um, United States District Court of Southern District of New York um, has filed their charges. And they and so these are the kind of the headlines uh, of the charge uh, from at least May 2019 through November 2022. Now, that's not very long, right? May 2019 through 2022. Um, Bankman Freed engaged in a scheme to defraud equity investors in FTX Limited. Uh, Bankman Free portrayed himself as a responsible leader of the crypto community. And this is this is part of that simple jack defense, right? That's going to be a problematic for him because he was out touting his his expertise. Bankman Free hit all of his uh, all of the uh, facts of using customer funds to make undisclosed venture investments, lavish real estate purchases and large political donations. They hit all that from FTX's equity investors, including U.S. investors, from whom he sought to raise billions of dollars in additional funds. And there's going to be the other problem with the equity, private equity guys. They're going to come after him as well. While he spent lavishly on office space and condominiums in the Bahamas, sank billions of dollars of customer funds into speculative venture investments, he built a house of cards, which began to crumble. 
Bangman Free directed FTX to divert billions more in customer assets to Alameda. That's where his girlfriend worked. Uh, to ensure that it maintained its lending relationships and that money could continue to flow in from lenders and other investors. So so basically, it was almost a Ponzi scheme, right? You're, you're bringing money in from investors to fund other investors, right? That's basically a Ponzi scheme. They conclude by saying, but Bankman Free did not stop there. Even as it was increasingly clear that Alameda and FTX could not make customers whole, Bankman Free continued to misappropriate FTX customer funds. That's going to be the part that hangs him up a bit. His brazen multi year scheme finally came to an end when FTX, Alameda, and their tangled web of affiliated filed for bankruptcy in November 11, 2022. First thing to note in the sheet is as i said is from may 2019 and by which that's what the sec means is being ftx's entire existence so ftx went from nothing to major fraud in two years three years pretty incredible good 36 months of living though tiger by the tail you just have to make sure that uh it doesn't come back to bite you, unfortunately. Anyway, wraps up the show. We'll be back tomorrow. We'll talk more about this with uh, Danny Ratliff as well. Uh, we'll figure out what happens today and what we need to do next. <clears throat> so enjoy your day. Um, be sure and get the daily market commentary out this morning, as well as our latest newsletter and our blog post talking about where the best places to invest will be in the first half and second half of next year. That's on the website now, realinvestmentadvice.com. Have a great day. We'll see you back tomorrow.